Without further ado, I would like to introduce our institution's 12th president, affectionately known as President Joe, Dr. Joseph Bertolino. Thank you, Greg, and good morning, everyone. Well, as Greg mentioned, I'm Joe Bertolino, president of Southern Connecticut State University, and I'd like to welcome everyone who is joining us for this very special event. I also want to thank all our education alumni, partners, and friends um, who are able to participate today. I have to say that I am very proud to welcome our prestigious guests, Alberto Covello, the National Superintendent of the Year for 2014, and of course, our own alumna, Congresswoman Johanna Hayes, who was the 2016 National Teacher of the Year. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Stephen Hegedus, the Dean of the College of Education, and Dr. Cynthia McDaniel, Chair of the Educational Leadership and Policy Studies Department for serving as moderators for this important forum. The College of Education Colloquium Series has covered deep and relevant issues that affect our educational systems across the nation. Issues that resonate with the core of the social justice mission at Southern Connecticut State University. And we take a great deal of pride in our social justice mission here at the university and the work we are doing to be a social justice and anti-racist institution. Our institution has been educating teachers for well over a century. In fact, we have historically produced more teachers, more school administrators, and more superintendents than any of our peers. And yet the past year has presented challenges for teachers that we didn't foresee and thus couldn't have prepared for. I can empathize with those challenges I can empathize with what it means to be a teacher during these difficult times. And I can share with you that I too have a passion for being in the classroom, particularly as a former high school teacher. When, when schools closed uh, last year, sending everyone home, teachers had to quickly adapt and cope with the logistics of remote education. Um, I think it's safe to say that the basics of learning the technology and making sure students knew how to access their lessons, this was no easy feat. We heard from our student teachers that they faced the inevitability of their students being distracted as they learned from home. And the difficulty of monitoring each student's true understanding of the material while they were learning. This was difficult. Both teachers and parents have been concerned about the amount of time their students spend sitting in front of a computer screen each day. And they worry about how the lack of socialization and academic support impacts their students emotionally and academically. The pandemic, I think, has also highlighted inequities in our educational system in terms of a student's ability to access the technology needed for learning. Our faculty, our education students, and our alumni have risen to meet these challenges presented by COVID and its impact on our educational system. And they have learned important lessons, agility, adaptability, flexibility, all of these qualities have been key to educators during COVID. But the most adaptable teacher in the world can't reach a student who doesn't have access to the tools they need to be successful. So we know that access is critical to students, to children and their educational success. I think when the pandemic forced the Barack H. Obama Magnet University School on Southern's campus to temporarily close last year, each student was provided with a device, either an iPad or a Chromebook, and the school district provided hotspots and Wi-Fi for students' homes. The Obama school's principal, 
uh, Susan DiNicola, is a Southern alumna. And we have education students doing their student teaching there. I might add that the school had just opened as a brand new school here on our campus. So to open and then to suddenly have to close was certainly difficult and painful. But Susan and her team recognized that for their students to succeed during this most challenging time, they needed first and foremost to have the tools necessary to access what the teachers could deliver an excellent education. Superintendent Carvalho and Representative Hayes will be able to speak in much more depth about the lessons learned during COVID. And I wanna thank them for sharing their expertise and insights with us today. Again, my thanks to the College of Education for their continued good work. And I thank you for the work that you are doing out in the field on the front lines, serving our students in the classroom, whether it's on ground or virtually every day. So I hope that you enjoy uh, this morning and this afternoon's colloquium. And I thank you all again for joining us. Thank you, be well. And now I believe I get to turn it back over to Greg Bernard, our Director of Alumni Affairs. Greg? It's back to me, Joe, it's fine. Thank okay. you very much, it's all right. <laughs> very good, well. Thank you, President Joe. Yeah, Thank I appreciate you. those welcoming remarks. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it gives me great pleasure today to introduce to you Alberto Calvallo, who has served as the superintendent of Miami-Dade County Public Schools, the fourth largest school system in the United States since September 2008. He is an expert on education, transformation, finance, and leadership development. And during his tenure, he's become one of the highest performing urban school systems in the US. The district has also been named as the 2014 College Board Advanced Placement Equity and Excellence District of the Year, as well as the 2012 winner of the Broad Prize for Urban Education. He has expanded school choice options in Miami-Dade to over a thousand offerings that include bilingual programs, fine and performing arts, biotech, engineering, robotics, aviation, forensic science, and many, many others. Mr. Carvalho is also the proud founder and principal of the award-winning iPreparatory Academy that has become a model of 21st century learning in the age of innovation and technology. <laughs> he has many, many honors, but particularly uh, the honor of being the National Superintendent of the Year in 2014, uh, really did uh, add to all the recognition that he has done uh, since, the, since that, up to that time and since that time. Uh, we are well, very happy to uh, welcome Mr. Carvalho here today. I had the great pleasure of meeting him over 10 years ago at the University of Massachusetts at the installation of the Chancellor at the time. And uh, we are gonna have a really um, very deep reflection on the future of our children's education uh, after COVID. And I thank you once again, uh, Mr. Carvalho, for joining us today and sharing with you, with us, your expertise. I'm now passing it to my um, colleague, Dr. McDaniels, who is co-hosting the uh, this event with me, and she will begin uh, with some questions for Superintendent Carvalho. Thank you, Dean Hegedus, and thank you, President Joe. Uh, I would like to begin with. Um, my first question to, uh, to Dr. Um, Carvalho, you have an amazing career. You've done so many wonderful things in the field of education. So I would like you to share with us uh, more about your personal story. Where are you from and uh, who are you now? And what has shaped uh, your uh, views on education? So again, could you just tell us a little bit about you? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for that uh, question, Dr. McDaniels. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, for the invitation to participate in this important, uh, this important event to really hopefully tackle some of the most pernicious, intractable issues facing our country today. And uh, it's an interesting way to start, you know, who am I and where did I come from? Because I really do think that it is relevant to the conversation. 
for I see myself in the eyes of the students that I teach every single day. And let me begin there. I mean, we are a massively large school system uh, of uh, close to half a million students from pre-K to adult, about 360,000 pre-K 12 students uh, in a minority majority community where over 90% of our children are black and brown. They are uh, Hispanic, Latino, and, and, uh, and black. Uh, where 60,000 of them are English language learners. 11% of them have one or more disability. And remarkably, about 73% of them live at or below the poverty level. And I say that because I am a reflection of the student body that I hope to inspire and teach. And, uh, and the reason is that, number one, I check off all the boxes. I am an immigrant to this country. I came alone at the age of 17. I was born into abject poverty. Mom and dad did not have any more than a third grade education. Mom was a seamstress, dad was a custodian. Uh, we were six altogether. Unfortunately, two of my siblings passed away uh, too prematurely uh, through causes that would have been absolutely curable or preventable in this country as a function of poverty. We grew up in a one room apartment with no running water or electricity. A curtain separated mom and dad from us. I was the first and only in my family to graduate high school. And uh, it was not until my youngest brother, who is uh, 10 years younger than I am, who's almost like a brother son to me, uh, who then graduated high school and made it to college. Uh, but back in the early 80s, I knew that my parents possessed neither influence, power, uh, or uh, funding. Therefore, college would have been negated to me. So I worked for eight months scrubbing decks on ships to earn my way to America. And yes, I came in on a tourist visa, which I overstayed becoming what was known then and is now even better known today as an unaccompanied minor. Uh, some would call me an illegal alien. And uh, after crisscrossing the country at 30 some states, after first working as a dishwasher in Manhattan, New York City, construction work, day labor, uh, finally landed in South Florida. And, uh, and uh, I came to this country, yes, to work hard, but also to study and to embrace this opportunity that this, uh, this blessed land has provided to so many before me. And today, as I said, uh, I stand uh, as a reflection of many of the students we teach who have traveled the same journey or whose parents have traveled the same journey. And in, truly as an unremarkable human being as I am, I stand as proof positive that the impossible can become the inevitable uh, in the lives of these students. So I will leave it there for now. So you, you, you got that I'm, I was an illegal alien and a company minor immigrant to this country, did not speak English when I first arrived. So I was ELL, I've always dealt with, uh, with a, a disability uh, so, as I said, uh, I, I check off all the boxes that matter in our country uh, today. And we're finally, finally uh, taking full account uh, of the fact that the diversity of our nation is our most powerful tool in dealing with the problems the world faces today, not a hindrance. Doctor, you, Cynthia. Sorry about that. Um, so, Alberta, uh, you've had such a uh, why a diverse and varied uh, uh, career. How has all of this uh, impacted your leadership goals, vision, styles, and all aspects of leadership? Those early experiences. Sure. So n number one, it, it has enabled me to, to see perspectives that uh, I'm not exactly sure other people would see. So my perspective is not just a top-down perspective. I've done a lot of the work that individuals in my organization do at all levels. I sympathize, empathize, recognize the plight that children and their families go through in our community as a function of poverty, as a function of immigration, as a function of home insecurity, food insecurity, all elements well known to me. And I also recognize that this is complex, difficult work that cannot be achieved by a single entity. Uh, so it has influenced my leadership style and the prioritization of that, which I feel is, is most critical uh, by addressing, no doubt, the academic gaps that children face, but also recognizing 
the social gaps that precede these academic gaps and uh, really understanding that these unmitigated social gaps become uh, difficult academic gaps and those academic gaps, if not addressed, become lifelong arresting uh, economic gaps lived by many adults in our community. Uh, my leadership style is one that is facilitative in nature. It is one that brings together the equivalent of teams of rivals. <laughs> so people who are uniquely bright, bring different perspectives, don't necessarily need to like each other's personality, but are absolutely in love uh, with the function, the purpose uh, that is before us. And part of my leadership is also one that attempts to turn complex issues into uh, uh, simple solutions uh, by keeping the main thing, the main thing all the time, and rallying my team around that. And nothing is more important than the well-being, the welfare, the education of children, and the fundamentally important responsibility that we have uh, to sustain democracy in this country through the power of public education. And um, forgetting no one. Uh, so uh, I, I think that uh, pretty much describes uh, the leadership style that uh, we have demonstrated over the past uh, past uh, close to 13 years, uh, uh, my team and I, and uh, also reflects uh, our ability to dynamically pivot based on uh, emerging conditions in this country. And I'll just reference, you know, we, we've had a tough year. I think uh, no one can underestimate the difficulty that we have lived through. I mean, what started out as a health crisis uh, over a year ago, uh, was then further disrupted and compounded by a social injustice crisis that was so visible to all of us. Uh, this has had a, a, in my belief, a terrible trauma effect on the minds of adults, but uh, the minds of children as well, the minds of young people during the time that they were under social isolation and not necessarily in environments that could decode these events for them. And then of course, to make matters worse, we're now flirting with an economic crisis, the likes of which may dwarf uh, the great recession of 2008, 2009. So the leadership that we have uh, uh, demonstrated needs to be one that pivots based on events, but needs to be one that's grounded on the main thing. And for us, the main thing is uh, the achievement of all children, is the rapid acceleration of children towards their full potential. Okay, and, and, and one last question, Alberto. How do you address the racial uh, and other inequalities uh, in your district? You have such a large district and a diverse uh, student population and multiple communities. Uh, could you just expand uh, just for a minute on how you address these very, very challenging and difficult uh, circumstances? Sure, and, and, and I appreciate the question because uh, the answer to that question was further uh, complicated, made more difficult uh, due to a political rhetoric that permeated our country for quite a while uh, that really accentuated the differences as something uh, to be maligned rather than recognizing diversity as a strength. And the polarization of America was seen at all levels. But where my hope rests is actually with the young people of America, who I believe are more enlightened, reflect more promise, and uh, are more accepting of today's reality that is so revealing to them, and much more willing and accepting uh, of uh, the dark history that all of us need to, uh, to have awareness of. So I'm inspired. But what we have done for a long time in our school system is number one, we acknowledge who we are. We are fully aware of who we are. We are this place called Miami uh, that is so different from the rest of America and so close to America, we could almost be part of the country <laughs> where a multitude of languages are spoken from Spanish to Portuguese to Haitian Creole, uh, where over 160 different nations are present so diversity is not only spoken about, it is lived. And within that diversity, obviously, there is the racial diversity. And the way we tackle it is uh, number one, recognizing who we are. Secondly, uh, putting diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, as uh, the focal point and, and the markers, the guardrails of everything we do. Uh, whether we're talking about policies, we're talking about 
the way we teach children, the way we hire people, the way we train people, ongoing professional development to address the sensitivities or insensitivities, whether they are macro or micro in nature, the establishment of offices that deal specifically with racial uh, equity issues, with diversity and inclusion, creating even policies uh, for the purpose of procurement that recognize the historic economic disparities and address them by leveraging those who never got enough with the opportunity through procurement processes to stimulate and accelerate their economic growth. And then last but not least, it is a matter of actually teaching. It is a matter of actually teaching race and anti-racism in our schools and creating the cultures that uh, make, it, uh, make it relevant and quite frankly, visible to everyone all the time. And last but not least, I think we have a collective responsibility. We've done it to speak about it. So you acknowledge it, you teach it, you monitor it, you create policy and procedures that ensure that it is done. Uh, you recalibrate when there is a need, and then you talk about it with pride, uh, about what you've done, even sometimes in the context of attacks, mainly from outside of Miami-Dade, about some of our policies or some of our practices that tack tackle some of these rather uncomfortable issues that must be addressed by us. If not us, then who? And if not now, then when? And by by what standards. So th that's what we've been doing in, in Miami-Dade in the community where 65% of our students are, are Latino, uh, where about 20% of our students are, are black. And when I say black, they could be Caribbean black, African-American, um, uh, Haitian-American, which comprises a huge uh, dynamic of our population. But that only makes us strong considering our uh, academic data at the national level, looking at NAEP and looking at TUDA, I can tell you that diversity is not a hindrance to performance. If we acknowledge it, if we know where the gaps are and we address them. Thank you so much. Um, before we continue, uh, are there any questions? Um, Stephen, did any questions uh, come up in the chat room that we can uh, address? Not just yet, but um... yeah. We can uh, prompt folks to um, write a question for Superintendent Carvalho. Um, and whilst you do that, um, I have one more question um, as a segue to that uh, for the superintendent. Um, thank you, Cynthia. Um, we, we would like to ask you uh, um, some specific questions about resources as well. Um, sure. And what uh, my question is sort of two part. Um, when we met, I was at, we were in. Uh, Fall River and New Bedford in Massachusetts, and I was running a center there that um, looked at using technology to, to uh, address the academic gaps in those communities, particularly. And uh, as you know, many, uh, many, of the, um, many of the students have backgrounds there from Portugal and Cape Verde as well in, the, in those cities. Um, so we had a, a, a complex problem that we were trying to address. And that as a mathematician and an educational technologist, it, I know it takes a long, long time. It takes um, many years, over a decade to try and impact and make some change there. So my question to you um, um, is two parts. Um, what was the role of technology in your district? And I hope people comprehend how big your district is. You know, hundreds of thousands of students and, and, and tens of thousands of, 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 of teachers and staff. What was the role of technology in your district during COVID, during this year, past year, particularly with regards to closing or addressing at least academic gaps? And what do you see as the role of technology in the future for Miami-Dade County? Certainly, so ter terrific question. Um, we were, in my opinion, and uh, now we know beyond my opinion uh, through the recognition of others, we were far better positioned than most districts in a country, large, medium sized or small. And there's a reason for that. Uh, we anticipated and recognized uh, going back to 2010, 11 and leading to 2012, uh, that technology was an indispensable environmental reality that needed to be present, available, accessible to all students. And I, I no longer speak of technology as, as a tool. 
It needs to be a, an environmental reality that's accessible and lived by every single student. Uh, however, we were facing a problem, uh, the issue of uh, inequities in terms of access to devices, connectivity, digital content, which led in many cases uh, to students who rely on school bus transportation, getting on the bus at the end of the last bell, and from that moment on being disconnected from uh, reliable, viable, targeted, individualized uh, educational opportunity. And like other students who have multiple devices, live hyper-connected lives, and can continue to learn beyond the schoolhouse. Uh, so we needed to address uh, that, uh, that inequity. And back in 2012, uh, we passed in an anti-taxation uh, community, we passed a general obligation bond, a referendum that approved uh, $1.2 billion to be spent on school renovation, infrastructure, new school construction, but the first investments were in technology to address the digital divide, uh, to empower students with connectivity, dramatically expanded universal Wi-Fi access uh, through hotspots, beginning with uh, the students in poverty, families in poverty, empowering those students with a device, uh, with a hotspot for connectivity, but also the parent community of those students with a parent academy that was virtually accessible from their homes. That was a game changer for us. Uh, we termed it our digital convergence uh, initiative back then and was really to address the issue of the digital divide to eliminate, to obliterate the digital deserts in our community, which were so uh, concentrated on the same zip codes where poverty is high, home insecurity is high and food insecurity is at an abysmal level. Therefore, uh, we had the tools, we had the know-how, we had the training, we had the resources. Uh, when we had to, back in March of 2020, um, pivot to virtual learning, uh, we did so after having surveyed all of our parents, knowing exactly, despite our efforts, where some of the gaps still existed, and we were able to very quickly develop a an educational continuity plan, uh, dole out in excess of 127,000 devices for every single student who needed one, about 12,000 hotspots for connectivity, uh, in addition to uh, systems of support where parents and students could call in, dial in for technical support, but also educational support. Uh, that was a very seamless transition during the summer uh, we trained people. We attempted to launch a new platform. Unfortunately, the private sector entity did not deliver on what we wanted. So we started the school year again at the end of August with all students online, but very quickly pivoted in October uh, 5th of uh, 2020 with the reopening of 100% of our schools to all grade levels with about 50% of the students returning to the school, 50% of the students re, uh, remaining home uh, connected through my school online. So the tools that we had obtained prior to the pandemic were incredibly powerfully use, uh, useful uh, during the pandemic. These were tools we had. We have bought a lot more assets since the pandemic for the purpose of refreshing our assets. So I'll conclude by saying that, uh, look, in this hyper-connected society of today, the digitally disconnected is initially at a, at a terrible uh, educational disadvantage over time, a terrible economic deficit. Uh, so it is our moral responsibility. It is now a civil right of our time uh, to uh, have every single student empowered with access, equitable access uh, to strong digital tools that are personalized, individualized, they're monitored, that allow both for the acceleration as well as remediation uh, tools that touch both the student, but also the parent through parent academies, tools that empower parents with the ability from their homes to create echoes of learning for their own students. That's amazing. I mean, it's just massive, massive efforts that you've undertaken and will need um, to be sustained um, to, to sustain the impact over the future. So it is a, a highly complex and 
uh, such huge efforts uh, that need to um, be maintained. And I think one of the questions before I pass it back to Dr. McDaniels, who wants to talk to you about politics in Florida. I, 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 uh, oh, there's no such thing. I let, I let, I will let, I will let Cynthia handle that one. But before we, before I pass back, there was a, a question about how do you, how do you sustain? What sustained you, Alberto, in your difficult work? Oh, and there's um, another one that popped up. Sorry, and also, do you find disparities from the North Miami and South Miami? So there, we can, if you can address those sure. two questions, and then we'll move to politics. Sure. So the disparities within our own community are, are defined by the level of uh, socioeconomic status of the parents. And uh, so the disparity is not just uh, one of North versus South, uh, it is one of um, what would be referred to as suburban versus uh, inner city urban. Um, and, and, and we can talk about Homestead and Florida City in the deep South, very close to Keys where you have urban inner city conditions uh, where poverty is high, uh, language deficit is high as well, immigration concerns are high, et cetera. But then in central uh, Miami-Dade County, uh, in the Overtown, Liberty City area, you have the same exact conditions. Uh, in the North, you may have the same conditions around the Norland, Carroll City, Miami Gardens. Uh, where you have a greater wealth, middle class and higher is really on the western part of the county. And then obviously on the east part of the county, Miami Beach um, and uh, Aventura. So many different spots um, distributed throughout the community with high level of variability um, in terms of socioeconomic uh, conditions. The other question, you know, what sustains me quite frankly, uh, as I embed, uh, you know, leadership, the love for what we do, what sustains me really at this point uh, is, is the fact that I do see strong light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, now that we are once again realigning true science with practices across the country. Now that there is a rapid expansion of availability of vaccines and scientific pronouncements are guiding our population. Now that I think people are paying closer attention uh, to protocols that should be followed, I see light at the end of the tunnel uh, where I see that a new normal I think will be established for the beginning of the 21-22 school year. But uh, stronger than that, what sustains me is the true belief that what I do is as connected to sustaining, building and protecting democracy as anything I know. Public education, democracy are intertwined, two sides of the same coin. And that more than anything else sustains uh, and gives me the energy personally that I need to continue to do the work. And I know I'm not unique. I, I know thousands upon thousands of educators across America uh, see the value, the importance of teaching our kids, teaching our communities, and teaching not just the core subject areas, but teaching them also about these important elements of collaborative work, of teamwork, of empathy, of working well in diverse groups. You know, there's new elements that will be indispensable uh, in the future workforce that our country and our world will depend and rely on. So that uh, that's wonderful. I, there's been a, a, a flurry of questions as well, but before we, um, uh, and I believe the Congresswoman is just about to arrive. So I'll ask, I'll try and combine uh, two more questions before we move to the next section and welcome the Congresswoman. Um, there, there are a few questions around um, dual language education in your district and how the district supports student language and culture to develop multilingual citizens. Is there anything on those topics that you can um, sure. mention and what you're doing and what you feel you need to do in the future? Thank you. Very quickly. So we have a long, a long tradition in our community of believing in bilingual programs, dual language programs, international education. Yeah, so uh, we actually launched the very first uh, dual language program in the country at a school that still exists today. We've opened many schools that focus on dual language uh, education where students are basically learning part of the day in one language and the other part of the day in English, becoming dually proficient. And uh, if they continue, they actually end with diplomas at the high school level that are recognized in a multitude of countries on the basis of the standards. 
Uh, we also obviously believe in bilingualism and we have dozens of such examples in our community where bilingual educational programs are strong. Obviously we have an interest in uh, rapid immersion, uh, but uh, we recognize the value, the cultural, the historical, the traditional value of, uh, of a native language that students uh, speak and parents of our students speak. And we value it and we teach it. And we believe ultimately that uh, uh, you know, uh, speaking more than one, even in an accented way, much like me, is better than just speaking one perfectly. And so we are huge believers in dual language programs. Every year we roll out uh, additional opportunities for students through our choice portfolio, which you correctly said at the beginning, 74% of our students are enrolled in non-traditional programs. That means single gender programs, dual language programs, international baccalaureate, uh, Cambridge, uh, robotics, biomedical, you mentioned, we have something for everyone, one size fits none in Miami-Dade County Public Schools. So language is part of our DNA here in Miami-Dade. And, uh, and by the way, uh, it, it's a natural, but I think uh, the community would demand it anyway, as this community is very attached to its tradition, to its, uh, to its culture, uh, to its heritage. And uh, we should never forget that, and we should always respect that. Thank you very much, Superintendent. Um, I see that Congresswoman Hayes has joined us and I would like to formally um, welcome her as we transition to the, the next section, which I, I hope actually will be maybe a conversation between the two of you as you are both uh, uh, amazing academic and now political leaders as well. So please let me introduce Joanna Hayes. Uh, she is the US representative for the fifth congressional district of Connecticut. Uh, Representative Hayes was elected to the United States House of Representatives in November 2018, making her the first African-American woman and the first African-American Democrat to ever represent the state of Connecticut in Congress. Johanna first garnered widespread attention when she was selected as the Connecticut Teacher of the Year before going on to earn the distinction of 2016 National Teacher of the Year, leading to an invitation to the White House by President Barack Obama. In her capacity as National Teacher of the Year, she traveled the country and the world as an ambassador for public education, engaging all stakeholders in policy discussions aimed to improve outcomes for all our students. Congresswoman Hayes currently sits on the full House Committees of Education and Labor and Agriculture, and she has several subcommittee assignments as well, including early childhood, elementary and secondary education, civil rights and human services, livestock and foreign agriculture, nutrition and oversight and department operations. Uh, Johanna earned her bachelor's degree here at Southern in secondary education and teaching in 2005 and went on to receive several uh, graduate degrees in Connecticut as well. We are so very proud of you, Congresswoman Hayes. It is good to see you again. It has been, um, it has been a while since we were last together um, in, in Hartford, I think was the last time we were there, but uh, we miss you and we welcome you back virtually. And I'm not sure if you have met, I think Superintendent Carvalho has said he may have, um, you may have crossed paths in the, in, in the past, uh, which would be wonderful. So uh, welcome. And, uh, and uh, I will uh, work with Dr. McDaniels as we transition to the next section. Thank you, Dr. Hutchinus. <laughs> I was waiting for you to get to that all important last line. Yes. <laughs> She's a graduate of Southern. <laughs> yeah, and you are joined by many, uh, uh, many alum today um, so who are very proud of you too. Uh, Cynthia, I think we should move to the, the section where we were asking, gonna ask both of them similar questions. Um, so about the, um, and their response as leaders and maybe they can, if it's okay with our, um, our guests, our, uh, that, that they could um, dialogue between each other and, and com converse on these topics. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Congresswoman Hayes, for joining us. Uh, Stephen said he hadn't seen you in a while. Uh, I've seen you recently when you joined the Tiffany Cross uh, <laughs> program a few Saturdays ago. Uh, thank you for addressing uh, the many topics that uh, you were asked about, and um, I think the audience 
was well informed uh, about issues that they were not clear about. So thank you and good to see you. Uh, I Before I uh, transition to the latter uh, phase that uh, Stephen just mentioned, uh, I, I, I do want to talk a little bit about politics because it was brought up earlier <laughs> and I just can't let it go. Sorry about that. Um, so, um, and, and there's a connection obviously between policy and politics. So, uh, and, and both of you can, can join in. Uh, Al, uh, Alberto, um, what policies uh, are, are in play in, in, in your district um, to advance education? I think it's important that we, you know, have a policy uh, basis for uh, decision making. And so my question is, um, what are the policies and how does that intersect with um, politics in Florida? <laughs> Can, can you make that connection for us? And uh, uh, Johanna, please join in um, since you're in Washington making policies and so forth. Thank sure. you. Let me begin by number one, uh, greeting appropriately uh, Representative Hayes. It's so impressive uh, to meet someone who is a first at so many, uh, particularly in the field of education. And uh, I too uh, had the benefit of being at the White House with President Obama uh, multiple times as superintendent of the year. And I remember being surrounded by 50 teachers of the year from each respective state um, in a beautiful ceremony. And uh, I remember attempting to recruit every one of them to my district, uh, if these were the best in the country. So representative, I know you're tackling bigger issues at the national level, but you're always guaranteed an advanced contract in Miami. Um, you know, specific to the question that uh, Dr. McDaniels just asked, uh, you know, look, politics, cannot be divorced from education uh, any more than education can divorce itself from, uh, from the policy uh, that, uh, that we follow. I am blessed to work uh, with a board that is very policy driven. I'm also blessed to work in a community uh, where uh, we take tough stances, tough positions on issues, even if they are unpopular in the state or across the country. Uh, so we've taken as a system, a specific, policy positions, uh, some of them very personal to me regarding immigration, when I declare that there was a greater chance of the crown of Spain of reclaiming Florida than of me collaborating with federal entities that would lead to the apprehension of immigrant undocumented children or their families. And I actually announced that I would resign my position as superintendent uh, if there was any interference. And uh, that was not very popular. I remember re receiving a lot of hate mail and, and hate calls, particularly from robocall systems outside of, of the state of Florida. Uh, you know, we have dealt uh, more recently with obviously the, uh, the, the deeper looks that we had to do and new policies in light of the social injustices that were observed in, in the country and uh, be deliberate in our pronouncements, but also be deliberate in our implementation of curriculum that teaches anti-racism and really fosters better uh, culture and enables better diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, procedures. Uh, but then we also have taken uh, positions on, on issues uh, that, uh, that are a value uh, to the teaching methodology that, uh, that we're taking now. So for example, uh, we keep pushing for uh, a, a better look or a second look at seat time requirements for the purposes of uh, funding public education, because we've learned that parents want flexibility. They want individualized learning while still getting the benefit of socialization, which is so important. And last but not least, uh, I, I think that we have been consistent as a district and, and you know, the South Florida community is very different from the rest of the state of Florida in terms of its politics, in terms of its diversity. Uh, we've been very specific in, in pushing back against any political uh, uh, decisions, uh, practices uh, that uh, would impact uh, the way we see the world and the way we see our communities. Uh, anything that would interfere with the well-being of our students, the way we feed them, the way we care for them, um, the policies that we have adopted regarding uh, the elimination of outdoor suspensions, the decriminalization of minor offenses that have historically have targeted African-American males, those were all issues that were not popular 
but we had the political courage to actually tackle and do something about. Uh, Congresswoman Hayes, uh, did you want to add anything uh, on the national level where policy is being made? Well, there's so much to add about policy and education right now, but I think for me personally, this was a journey. I never wanted to be a politician and still have no desire to be a politician. I am a teacher. I always wanted to be a teacher. I poured my heart and soul into it. And I believe just so deeply in the profession and the profound work and the impact on students. During my time as National Teacher of the Year, I had a realization that so much of my work was, in fact, was impacted by policy decisions. So many of the barriers uh, of delivery of services for our students was impacted by policy decisions. So I have to tell you, it was a struggle for me. Um, my heart broke a little when I left the classroom, but I think that it has never been more important to have the voice of an edu educator in, in the rooms and at the tables where decisions are being made. I think that you know the, the last year and what we've seen with this COVID pandemic is a perfect example of the equity issues, of the barriers, of you know the physical structures of our buildings, and just just the disparities from communities to communities. For me, I would like to see I, I am moving legislation to try to diversify the education profession to really rethink what a family looks like. This presumption that everyone comes from a nuclear family and parents engage in the same way. Um, the fact that in March of 2020, we could not close schools for a public safety reasons without first considering how we would feed students, without next considering how we would deliver and, and have students get their mental health needs met. Those are all community-based issues that we need to address so that when kids come to school, they're ready to learn. And when they come to school, the people who are receiving them are properly prepared to teach them. So all of those things are so deeply personal to me. Um, I say it all the time, education saved my life. And I don't say that in a cliche way. I say that as, as literally and figuratively as I can. I know so many people from my community who did not make it. I was a teenage mom and a high school dropout and went on to be National Teacher of the Year and really changed the, the dynamics in my community. That means something. And I want to make sure that those opportunities are available for every kid who, who, who wants them and even the kids who don't want them because they don't know yet. You know, I want to make sure that we are standing in, in intercession for them. So we, I am, my policy focus is driven on equity. I'm making sure that every kid has access to those opportunities, no matter what they are, whether it be higher education, whether it be a trade school, you know, whether it be uh, service learning, anything that they want to do that we are prepared to meet them where they are and bring them along. And that requires robust investments from the federal level. It requires an acknowledgement that all kids from all communities have value, which is really important, especially now. And um, just to make sure that the policy is guided and, and bends in that way. Um, I'll wrap up finally by saying, I know that especially now in, in this day and age, it is more important to have educator voice as we are do, having a seismic shift in the way we deliver education. You know, we had a 19th century industrial education that we were delivering to students. And now we have to reimagine uh, with hybrid and virtual and just our physical space and all of these things. And that requires having someone who has some practical knowledge of the profession at the table. Um, those are all things that are, are really important. I, I was very surprised to find out just the number of years. There, there are people in Congress who have been teachers before, but you know there are decades since the last time they've been in a classroom. I literally worked in my school district on January 2nd, drove to DC and got sworn in on January 3rd. So I had a pretty recent um, <laughs> uh, knowledge of, of what was happening on the ground. And that is important. And I, I think about every day, every vote, every policy, policy decision that I'm making that impacts education. I can visualize a student, a parent, a teacher, a community member that is directly impacted and what I wish someone had been doing 
to address that before I got here. So um, I'm going to stop myself because I could go on and on about this one because it just, it is so, I, I, I bleed it. It is so important to me because I recognize, you know, when I was teacher of the year, people would always ask me, who's your favorite teacher? Who's the one teacher that impacted you? That was an impossible question for me to answer because every teacher I engaged with invested in me in a different way. And I, I just have just such a reverence for the profession um, and <laughs> just the love of, of learning and acquiring knowledge and having the opportunity to, to have that presented to me. I want every kid to experience that. So um, just, and that's, that's what drives my policy. So it's all about equity for me, that a through line of equity for everything from textbooks to buildings, to, to accommodations, to uh, diversity in the profession. Everything is about equity and meeting students where they are. I too should. You mute it, Dr. Dan McDaniels. Cynthia, you're mute, on mute. Stop that. Um, uh, I, I too share your passion and thank you for being in Washington and um, communicating that passion to, to your fellow colleagues and throughout the country. Uh, Stephen, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. McDaniels. Um, uh, we had um, a question for both of you, um, but I'm also noting that uh, superintendent may have to leave us soon. Um, but I, uh, I, the question that we had for both of you is linked to what you see still as the challenges and barriers in our systems and how you may respond to them as an educational leader and a political leader. But we've also had quite a few questions in the chat. So uh, they actually are getting more specific into that question because we've, we've spent quite a bit of time talking about challenges um, already today. Um, we actually have someone from our Southern newspaper here as, as well. And I think one of the questions that they have, um, uh, if they're still here, I'll ask the question because I think it does get at uh, challenges, but the future. And it's basically, what do you think teachers can learn uh, from this difficult year. Uh, and I actually would add, if I may, to that, teachers and school leaders, what, what, they, what can you learn from this uh, and move forward? And, um, and then there was a second question that gets at the uh, increasing evidence around use of social media, um, problems with addiction, mental health, socialization, and, and what do you recommend as getting the best out of technology you referred to quite a lot of the advances in technology whilst also trying to mitigate some of those risks. So um, with your um, teacher, leader, um, political hats on, um, do you have an answer for our newspaper about what do you think teachers can learn from this difficult year? I'll just say really quickly. So two things, um, when we talk about, I know you spend a lot of time talking about challenges. For me, if we can, if I had to make a priority list, the top thing that I think that we need to do as elect at, from the federal level is to fully fund IDEA. I think for so many districts, if we could fully fund um, so that they can meet the needs of their special education students, it would free up resources for them to do what needs to be done. I think we can go down the list of challenges, but that would really just take so much off of the plates of state and local districts to then begin to reallocate resources to do other things. When we talk about the last year, I, the teacher in me, while everyone was talking about all of the challenges and how difficult the school year was, I couldn't help as an educator, but to see the opportunities in it. We saw so many districts embrace virtual learning. We saw kids being able to visit a collection at the Library of Congress and engage with other students across the world. We saw in my state of Connecticut, probably the elimination of the snow day, because you know you can say tomorrow's a storm, we're going to go virtual. Um, I think the challenges came in that people were not prepared and many of our teachers just took it upon themselves to make this shift in some, in some places 48 hours without the proper training, without the resources ne necessary, without the practice at using these platforms, but I think if we step back from this year, there are so many opportunities for us to really 
thrive, you know, in the midst of everything bad that happened, there were so many opportunities to reimagine the way we're delivering instruction, to telework, to be able to engage with colleagues, to lay out our physical spaces differently, to address uh, the air quality in our buildings. And, you know, some of the things that we've always known were a problem. So while there were so many challenges, I think in education, in the world of education, there were also so many opportunities. Um, parent conferences, I've heard districts report that they're having, you know, close to 100% participation in virtual parent conferences, which is something that was very difficult. If you were a single parent without transportation or your kid's school was across town, you couldn't make it to parent conferences. So now having the ability to engage virtually, to set up a time and meet with your students, with your child's teachers, um, for us to look at broadband differently. So while there are so many challenges, I think that educators rightfully are really um, embracing the opportunities and the lessons that we've learned from the last year. And I think that we will see a lot with um, teacher preparation programs, with professional developments, with really thinking outside of the box and doing things that many districts were reluctant to even attempt uh, a year and a half ago. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman. Superintendent? So I, I would uh, I would agree so hard and so 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 aggressively with uh, everything that uh, that Representative Hayes just stated. Uh, but a couple more things. Uh, yes, in Miami Dade we have recognized the challenges, but we have tried to flip them into true opportunities to re envision and reinvent public education in our community. Uh, from the learnings that we obtained, primarily driven by the interactions between teachers, students, and teachers and parents. Uh, in many ways, uh, the access barriers that once existed were brought down because we had the courage, uh, side by side with the tools and right investments, uh, to create pathways of communication with students and, and parents. In some cases, less than ideal, we still struggle as the rest of the country, do country does uh, with the most effective way for students to learn online who may have a severe disability uh, to really maximize the educational opportunity as declared in the IEP. I am thrilled to hear Representative Hayes advocate strongly for uh, full funding of IDEA, which has been promised for decades, at least the 40% of the average cost of education for students with disabilities. And in, in the best of years, maybe we've gotten to less than 50% of that. You know, what are we saying about our country uh, when we are not leveraging adequately the appropriations to sustain and educate some of the most vulnerable populations? I think our teachers also recognize something and forced us to recognize something that they knew all along is that uh, the COVID crisis, and, and I know now many people are referring to a lot of our kids who are going through a terrible academic regression, right? This learning loss that's impacting disproportionately as students of color, as students in poverty and students with disabilities and students who are English language learners. These are the same kids who were in crisis before COVID. So let's not kid ourselves. All of a sudden, we are waking up to the fact that, you know, the disparities are growing and, and the COVID crisis is really impacting these kids. But these kids were in severe crisis prior to the COVID uh, reality hitting America. And so our teachers continue to inform us. We use our teachers our, as thought partners in, uh, in declaring one thing. Uh, with the resources that we're receiving from the federal, federal government, uh, particularly through the American Recovery Act. For, for Miami-Dade, it is a lifesaver. We're gonna use them to put to students first, teachers first. In fact, the concept of year-round schooling, the concept of holistic education, pedagogical acceleration side-by-side -side with social and emotional uh, attention and mental health throughout the summer. Uh, it's going to allow us to open 180 schools and bring back close to 70,000 students who have been targeted and picked, selected on the basis of their crisis level, driven by our teachers in terms of the identification. I think what teachers also uh, told us um, and have benefited from was this tectonic shift, not gradual, this te tectonic shift in terms of the new technological reality, digital content manipulation and interaction. They have become masters at it. And we're talking about new teachers to the profession, mid-career teachers, but also more tenured teachers. That shift has been powerful. 
And I think what teachers are asking is now, much like parents is, listen, the new reality going in 2021, 22 cannot be just going back to the old reality. So we need to be empowered and continue the good things we've learned, actually accelerate those, fortify those in terms of student achievement and the perennial intractable achievement gaps that we see. It's not a matter of simply catching these kids up to where they were prior to the pandemic. We now have the resources, we have the tools, we have the willingness uh, to actually obliterate uh, those gaps once and for all. And I think key uh, to these efforts are teachers and the support systems that they must have. And I just jump in because I'm so happy that Superintendent Carvalho acknowledged that this American Rescue Plan has teacher prints all over it. These are, you know, $130 billion, a phenomenal investment in public education, the likes that we've never seen before. But all of this legislation were things that we introduced in the 116th Congress. We had legislation, um, a $50 billion school infrastructure bill to address crumbling infrastructure and air quality in schools. I introduced a Safe Education Job Act to make sure that we had social workers and nurses on the ground in our schools. Um, we had um, school safety and preparedness. We had school discipline. We were talking about all of this legislation before the pandemic hit. And what this pandemic did was lay bare that these problems have long existed and we need a massive investment. We need to value education in a very different way and not only value it, but back that up with appropriating the necessary funds. For many of our districts, unfortunately, even the size of, of the federal investment will only bring them back to zero. They were so far behind that even with, you know, th these huge influx of federal dollars, they'll only be able to get back to zero. They can't even, you know, project and prepare for the coming years. So we have to continue, you know, to reassess, to regroup, to engage with, with educators on the ground and local leaders to figure out what those needs are and close those gaps. But these have long existed. These have long existed. And, and it was one of the things where in, in my first term in Congress, you're trying to explain to people, my colleagues, I know what you're trying to do, but let me help you understand what happens on the ground. We were having conversations about college affordability, about student debt and all of these things. And then the pandemic hit and all, there was just, uh, it was an inflection point where we had to, you know, figure out how to modernize our systems, make the appropriate investments, support our students and our teachers and our education institutions. And we were forced to do it in real time. So again, it's one of those things where there's a long list of all of the challenges of this pandemic, but it has presented us with unique opportunities. Never again can anyone say, I didn't realize how bad it was. I didn't realize that this was the crisis of our public education system. Never again could someone say, well, I don't have kids, so I don't pay attention. Everybody understands, recognizes, and appreciates the importance of our systems, the gaps in our systems, and the need for um, resources and investments. If I could add something very quickly, I think what the representative just said is so correct. There's a new level of awareness. Um, and that level of awareness, by the way, extends to parents as well. For the better part of a year, parents had a front row seat to that computer screen that their kid was glued to. And they saw and know what they liked, what they didn't like, they have told us, right? And we have used that powerful voice and the powerful voice of students alongside the powerful voice of teachers to really reinvent public education as we know it. And, uh, and look, uh, the Congresswoman says something that's very true. It is not good enough. It is not sufficient for us to just go back to zero. And going back to zero is to eliminate the deficit that we currently face as a result of the COVID crisis. As I said earlier, if all we do is that, all we'll be doing is restoring students to the gap levels that they were in prior to the pandemic. We have a moral and professional obligation to actually do much better than that. So uh, using these federal funds, number one, the American Recovery Act, but as the Congresswoman said, on a recurring basis, the possibility of really having a sustained and dramatically increased level of appropriation for Title I, for Title III, for English language learners, IDEA is critical, is critical for us to accelerate 
every single student towards their full potential. Just imagine you know, a world in America where intervention materials for tiered interventions are available to every kid, where every single school has reading and math and literacy coaches, behavioral coaches, where every single school has the additional mobile devices for students and guaranteed connectivity, not just at school, but anywhere. Funds for interventionists at the community side, but also schools. Enhancements to this multi-tiered system of support that's aligned with the needs of the students. Just imagine America where every single child and parent has the opportunity for a high quality early childhood education. This is not an expenditure, it's an investment. That's so what I'm talking about. <laughs> EPK programs for all. And then imagine an America where every single child, every single school has the wraparound services at every single school that address the social issues that are not born in the school, but are born in the community. And if we start that early enough, we're gonna get somewhere. And that is enabled, yes, with the recently approved and appropriated funds, but for the long haul, Title I, Title III, IDEA, that's where, that's where the true possibility for the future lies. And I'm very confident that this Congress uh, will get it done. No pressure, Representative Hayes. I know we have your vote. <laughs> I'm going to work in Miami Day. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that, wonderful. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, I love that. Uh, imagine. Uh, reminds me of John Lennon's song, Imagine. Uh, with the two of you leaders, I can see that imagination uh, coming to fruition and being a reality. Um, I think there's one more piece that, and you touched on it, Superintendent Carvalho, um, the link between school and community. Because now with this American Rescue Plan, there is an emphasis on learning loss, after school programs, enrichment programs, summer programs, engaging our community centers and our community partners. One of the things that I learned as an educator is that a school is really just geography. I would take my kids out into the community and we would do community service and, and different projects and engage with stakeholders and leaders and really promote just increased investment from everyone to elevate and educate our kids. And I think at this, on the other side of this pandemic, what I would like to see is a sense of community where we all take responsibility for the education of our children. It is not just the teachers and the superintendents on site in schools. It is every one of us. It is making sure that we have those wraparound services and those community partners where we all have a sense of responsibility and obligation for the well-being of our children. And I think that sense of connectedness has come out of as what I've seen in this pandemic. You know, we saw teachers having car parades and delivering lunches and checking in on students. You know, we are talking about rural broadband and closing the digital divide and making sure that those equity gaps where kids were parked outside of Burger King in order to access internet, in order to do homework, no longer exist. You know, just kids just need a shot and they need the adults who are in charge to, you know, move all the things out of the way that prevent them from having a straight line to academic success. and. I am, I am wildly optimistic about that. You know, some people, some of my colleagues say I'm borderline naive, but I've seen what happens in a classroom. And, and I, I just know that a lot of it was for lack of will uh, because we have the ability to make these changes. Um, and, I, and I really believe that we are, we are at a point in our society as a history teacher, you know, there's all of these turning points in history and I just am just optimistic about what happens next for public education because um, we, we, we need it so badly. So thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman. Thank you, uh, Superintendent. I hope the, uh, the reporter, the student reporter uh, got enough uh, of an answer to her question. Uh, I would uh, like to formally um, um, uh, close by thanking the Superintendent Alberto Carvalho, it has been uh, once again a very inspiring time with you um, today um, with uh, regards to your, your passion, your energy, your commitment over many, many years. Uh, we thank you for joining us here at Southern Connecticut State University um, to share with our alumni and our friends uh, and our faculty and staff and students who have joined us today 
uh, about your journey, your voyage, uh, and your future goals and aspirations. Thank you. Thank and similarly, you. Congresswoman Hayes, it is wonderful to see you again. Uh, and you are awesome as ever, and you have done wonderful things, and you'll go on to, to make the kinds of changes, we hope, that we have discussed this morning. Um, I have been committed to um, um, doing a day on the hill uh, in, in uh, Washington every year since I've been here for seven years with my student leadership group, which are undergrad and grad students. And we will, every time we go down, we go to see our two senators and our five elected officials, our, our, our representatives. We will be coming to see you and, and we will be <laughs> joining you uh, in, that, in that journey and that voyage. Uh, I thank you both from my heart. I thank you for, on behalf of myself and Dr. McDaniels, uh, on behalf of the College of Education and the students, the alumni, uh, and on behalf of Southern Connecticut State University. Uh, thank you both so much. Uh, and um, and uh, Godspeed and good luck with all the work that you do. Cynthia, would you like to add any further closing comments? You've said it all, but again, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for everyone who has joined us this year. This is the uh, culminating um, uh, uh, um, presentation for our virtual colloquium series and thinking about the future and opportunities. We may continue to do this as well as on ground. So. Um, we hope that we can continue this critical dialogue, this important dialogue with you, uh, our community, uh, both local, uh, national and international as well. So, so thank you very much. It is our day of caring next week. Please do share that news on April 28th. Um, so please uh, share the news to give uh, to us for, for our students um, and to, to support them in their studies. I appreciate all that you have uh, done so far. Thank you once again, Superintendent, Congresswoman. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.